Hey there, puzzlers! My name is Fleb, and today we're going to be continuing our journey into the world of logic puzzles by taking a look at the second puzzle from last year's US Puzzle Championship. It's an example of a cave puzzle, and this one was made by Nikoli, which is one of the best Japanese logic puzzle manufacturers. You can, if you want to solve this puzzle yourself, I've put a link in the description to the US Puzzle Championship from last year, which is where this puzzle is from. Now this is an example of what's called a cave puzzle. So what you're doing is you're drawing a single closed loop around this grid, such that all of these numbered squares are inside of the loop. So for example, this could not go outside the loop like this. That's not possible. In addition to that, each square tells you how many squares it sees in each direction, including itself. Now they have a little example up here, and I'm going to focus on that for a moment. So here you can see the shaded part is the outside of the grid, and the unshaded part is the inside. And that line is what separates the inside from the outside. This 3 sees 3 squares total on the inside of the loop. 1, 2, 3. This 7 sees 7 squares. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so on and so forth. And so the object is to create that loop from the initial puzzle, which would be something like what's shown here. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. One way that you can start solving cave puzzles is by looking at small numbers. For example, we have this 2 here. Now I'm going to use my own, no my own notation, which is a little bit different than what you might want to use for speed solving, but which I think is going to make this a little bit easier to see. When something is inside of the loop, I'm going to shade it. And when it's outside, I'm going to use a minus sign. So here, this 2 is going to be inside the loop because it's a number, and this 4 is also going to be inside the loop because it's also a number. And that tells us that this 2 is already filled. This cannot be shaded, or it would see 3 squares. That can't, that can't, and that can't. Now here's the first instance of something that's very common in cave puzzles. Do you see this pattern here? Where you have the outside, inside, outside pattern? What if this square was to be inside the loop? One of the rules of cave is that everything inside the loop is connected. So this would have to either connect there, or it would have to connect there. I'm using this line to draw approximately where it would have to go. But the point is that it would fully enclose one of these inside regions. That would mean that there would be two loops. If we take another look at the example, you can see this. If this square were to actually be inside the loop, instead of outside, you'd have this inner loop like this, as well as this outer loop. While the rules say that you only want to draw a single closed loop. So whenever we see a checkerboard pattern, we know we've done something wrong. We should never have a set of two by two squares that are in this sort of checkerboard pattern. What that tells us immediately is that this is going to be outside the loop. Now these are going to be inside because they're numbers, and we have the same checkerboard pattern here. So this has to be inside the loop to prevent that. This 3, if it were to connect down here, would have more than 3 squares that it sees. And now this 5 needs to be fully filled. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This 6 only has one more square it can see. It needs one more square. And here we have another checkerboard pattern. So we can fill that in. This 4 is now completely filled, and we have another checkerboard pattern. I hope you can see how important those alternating patterns are. Here's another checkerboard. Let's take a look at this other two. That two gave us this whole region here just by looking at it, so maybe the other one will help us as well. Can this two go like this up here? No, it'd have three squares. That allows us to get two more squares that we know are going to be outside the loop. What about this three down here? Well, it can't go up, then it would see four squares. And it can't go down, because then it would also see four squares. Now here's an interesting one. This six here has, is attached to a three. 
That means it can never see more than three squares in a given direction here, horizontally. It could either be something like that, or it could be on the other side, here. But in any case, it can see a maximum of three squares here. So three, four, five means that this square has to be filled, has to be inside of the loop. If this were outside, this six could not see six squares that are inside the loop. That gives us that square, which gives us this one as well. Now, what if this three were to see its third square here? Well, this three would be fully filled, and we'd fill in these two parts as being outside of the loop, or the three would see too many squares. But that creates one of the checkerboard patterns that we saw before, that we know we can't have. So that three cannot go there. That's also a surprisingly common piece of logic. Fixing the checkerboard pattern here. This two cannot connect across. Fixing the checkerboard pattern, that two is now filled. Another very common thing to keep in mind is that the outside squares have to reach the edge of the board. For instance, if we had a inside square here, we'd have two loops. Can't have two loops, so this must be an outside square. Another very common piece of logic. Now this six down here, it sees three squares above it. It's going to see three squares in its own row, so it's fully filled vertically, and we can place in those two as places where it can't go. Up here we have a three. It needs to see three squares. It can see at most one above, so one, two. It needs to see one more this way. That three cannot connect up. It must go horizontally, fixing the checkerboard. Now take a look at this eight. Big numbers are also very important in CAVE because they tell you a lot of squares have to be filled in. It can see at most one, two, three, four before it has to start looking left. So we know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight have to be filled in in order for this to work, in order for this clue to be filled. Now what about this eight here? If you were to fill in this eight purely vertically, one, two, three, four, five, six, it would attach the six clue here, meaning it could have at most six squares vertically. It must go horizontally at some point, which tells us we have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fully filled all of those eight clues. Fixing the checkerboard here, completely fills that four. That three is now filled as well. This three is only one way to go. That eight was filled earlier. This three is now filled. This four also filled. Fixing the checkerboard, fixing the checkerboard. This six cannot go horizontally, so it must go purely vertically. One, two, three, four, five, six. This one is six squares, so we can fill those right in. Marking this as outside comes from the fact that this four is filled. This four now needs to be filled. Now it's filled. This three needs to get filled. One, two, needs to go up at least one. That gives it three squares that it sees. We can mark the other square as being outside the loop. What about this four down here? One, two, three. It must go at least one square to the left, at which point we have to fill this in to put in the checkerboard here. That fills that four and tells us something very interesting. Take a look at this region. All of these outside pieces here are connected. And what's more is they don't reach the edge. Now before I explain that if they don't reach the edge, if this were filled for instance, you'd have two loops, which can't happen. So this needs to be able to exit this region. There's only one place where it can here. So this must be outside the loop, as must this. From there, we don't know if it's going to connect here, or there, or maybe over there. We'll figure it out. But we can now fill the four. And we can now finish off the three. Which means that this four has to go to the right. This can't come down, because if it did, this three would see four squares. And now, if this were connected in the middle here, 
we'd have two separated regions. One of these, just these three clues here and the other, all the other clues kind of together. So that has to be outside the loop, and that tells us the final squares. And there you have it. So there are some common techniques that you can use to think about cave puzzles. There are a couple of things here that can help you. Looking at small clues, because they have very few places to go. Looking at large clues, because they have to fill a lot of squares. Using that checkerboard pattern to make sure that you don't accidentally create two closed loops. And then also making sure that all of your outside pieces are able to get to the edge, so you don't create two closed loops. I hope that you enjoyed this look at a cave puzzle, and I hope that the next time you take a look at a cave puzzle, you'll be able to apply some of these techniques. Thank you very much for watching, everyone, and as always, happy puzzling!